So our messages uh, in this season are under a theme of this is us, that there are certain things that make us us, and they're, that makes us different than a lot of them. There are others that uh, would believe differently, that would practice differently. These are things about FBC Allen that are part of who we are and what we're trying to become more of as a, as a people of God. And there, there are different ways that folks approach the gospel. For a lot of people, it's a, it's a one-way street, and it dead ends with the, the individual. It's about me and mine and, and, and what I need. It's a me-first kind of faith. How can God make me more comfortable? How can God uh, bless the purposes I've charted out for my life? And a whole lot of people are living the life in that way. One of my favorite statements that really is a strong biblical statement that is contrary to that self-centered, especially an Americanized view of Christianity, is this. God invites you to participate in the greatest, largest, most diverse, and most significant cause in history, His kingdom. History is his story, and God is building a family for himself. Nothing matters more. Nothing will last as long. From the book of Revelation, we know that God's global mission will be accomplished. Someday the Great Commission will become the Great Completion. And in heaven, there will be an enormous crowd of people from every tribe, race, nation, language that will one day stand before Christ and worship Him. And getting involved in that mission will allow you to experience a little bit of heaven in advance and what it will be be like. Now, we set out that big sweeping picture of the kingdom. But now is where we live. And there's the already, and there's the not yet. The not yet is that vision God has given us. The already is where we are today. And right now, about a third of the world's population claims some Christian identity. Now, considerably less than that third are actually born-again believers in Christ, walking in a relationship to God, will spend eternity in heaven. But they at least claim... I'm Christian as opposed to something else. Another third of the population of the world, well, they, they have no relationship to God through Christ. But they do have some kind of Christian witness to their culture in their language. So there's a touch with another third of the population that though they are not believers, they they have the opportunity, perhaps, to become a believer. And then there's that last third of the population of the earth, and they have no Christian witness, no voice for Christ. No one just now is telling them about Jesus. When we think about mission, and I'm talking about here in Allen, Texas, Collin County, and all the way to the ends of the world, we talk about being on mission for Christ. Sharing the good news of Jesus here near to the ends of the earth. And that it's our responsibility. And that's why I tell you, I told the staff this morning, I, over the last three days, I have sat with this message and I have carved it and I have redone it and I have torn things out of it. It's the most scarred up sermon manuscript I've dealt with in a long time. How do I explain this? How do I, how do I connect? How do I motivate? And I'm, I'm at a loss on this one because it's tough. Because how do you feel when you hear this message? And many of you have heard it so many times. We have responsibility for the whole world. For, for the gospel to go forth, it has to have Christians who believe the gospel is true and real and powerful and life-changing. And they're, they're living it themselves. And for most people, I think, that have been in church a long time, they say, I absolutely believe the gospel, the world needs the gospel. And I'm pretty sure somebody's working on that. That somebody somewhere is taking care of that for us. 
But, but do you believe it's somewhere in your job description as a Christ follower? And uh, For a lot of people, I think they think, well, uh, you know, watch the news. It's a messed up world out there, broken world in all kinds of ways. And, and uh, it reminds me of uh, the late 1700s. There was a, the guy we call the father of the modern missions movement, William Carey. And uh, he, he presented to a group of religious leaders in his day, we need to go and share the gospel with the world. These, these folks have no Christian witness. We've got to go to the ends of the earth. And this is what they told him. Young man, sit down. When God is pleased to convert the heathen, he'll do it without your help or mine. God's going to take care of that some other way besides, besides us. Uh, fortunately, William Carey did not pay attention to his elders. And if your elders are sinful elders, you don't need to pay attention to them. That's a, that's a good rule to follow, I suppose. Do you see your role as a Christian? As, uh, well, I want God to take care of me and take care of my family and help me to enjoy my life right now. And, and I'm going to wait around for heaven one of these days. Is that how you picture the Christian life? You know, God's given us a responsibility for our world and it's also true for our parts of the world. We talk about our circles of influence a lot. That God puts you in circles of influence with people that you already know who don't know Jesus. People that are going to be far from God unless someone tells them the story of Jesus. And that's your family, the people you work with, your neighbors, people you're interacting with on a weekly basis. And when I feel the world, I say, oh my, that seems a little unattainable to make me responsible for the world. And it's easy to withdraw and retreat and to delegate that task to uh, the professionals. They're professional missionaries, professional ministers. They'll, they'll take care of that stuff. These super Christians, they'll take care of that gospel sharing. And yet, that's not how the Bible describes a relationship to Christ. It, it's all of us in the game. All of us together, shoulder to shoulder, going into the world to tell people about Jesus. And God's God hasn't changed. His plan hasn't altered. It, this thing of gospeling, it's our job, our responsibility, our privilege as, as Christ followers. And Jesus said, commanded, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus charged, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses. Jerusalem, where they were, Judea, people in their area, but not living in their town. Samaria, people who are different from them. They're going to cross some cultural, socioeconomic, racial barriers. And then to the ends of the earth. This is the news we have to understand. That God has not changed his plan. His commands have not been altered. And he's called us to, to a lot more than just loving my Christian friends and enjoying my Bible fellowship group. And, and taking care of my family and waiting for heaven one day. My, my fear is that we, we've, lost, we've lost our balance in, in the Christian life. And a lot of people aren't a fully developing follower of Christ. And they have a piece of it, but they've denied a whole lot of the power of the gospel. And, and abandoned the call of the gospel. And as a result, we have a, have a lot of immature Christians who... They know Jesus... But they don't see the responsibility that others know Jesus. Our text this morning uh, is a charge to take the gospel to the world. And so for us, we, we have a heart. We're, a month from now, there'll be uh, 12, 11, 12 of us in Kenya telling people about Jesus. Because God didn't give me an out on that. Uh, later in the summer, we'll have a team in Zambia. Telling people about Jesus because the Bible tells me so. Uh, in the fall, we'll be in Asia. In, uh, we'll be looking at Eastern Europe this year and Central America. And so we're going to go well beyond here. And then we're going to do a lot of stuff regionally and cross-culturally. And we're going to continue to share boldly and unapologetically in the city. Paul was writing to Timothy. 2 Timothy is where we'll read uh, our text today. and It's probably the last thing Paul ever wrote. So the last thing somebody says, probably a big deal, especially if it's somebody like the Apostle Paul. The first, the first phrase 
of 2 Timothy chapter 2 says, You then, which means he's been talking to somebody else before. And what he's talked about, verse 15 through 18 of the first chapter, he said, there's some people that they just didn't get this. In fact, they rebelled against it, pushed back, ran from it, uh, made it more difficult. That didn't live the Christian life the way we're called to live the Christian life. And then he mentioned somebody that really did it well. And uh, someone who encouraged him, refreshed him, blessed him, shoulder to shoulder with him. And so he's got a contrast going the last part of chapter 1. When he begins chapter 2, he, he says, okay, so you. Because every one of us are going to fall in one of those camps. So you. And here's how he describes it. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. First a soldier, then an athlete. An athlete is not crowned, uh, doesn't receive the prize for winning unless he competes according to the rules. And then the third example he gives, it's the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I said, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember, and why do we celebrate the Lord's Supper? To remember Christ Jesus. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy, for if we died with him, we'll also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Today, I want to talk about the why of the gospel. Why why is the gospel precious and why is the gospel something that we have to tell other people about? Something we have to share with, with our circles of influence and to the ends of the world. Why the gospel? Here, here's some reasons. And yeah, I gave you a good outline today of uh, some of these things. Here's the first one. We have been given a great commission. God has given us this precious treasure of the gospel. A treasure. The life-changing. eternity altering power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is precious. And here we are, a third of the world doesn't know Jesus' name. And Paul says in verse 1 that it's by grace that we know Jesus, the unearned, unmerited favor of God. Uh, right now, I'm reading uh, my personal reading. I'm reading in Acts, I'm reading in Genesis. Well, in Genesis, the story uh, of Genesis, when you get to Abraham's God calls him out. You see it then played out in the New Testament where it says, why did God call out the Jewish people, the people of Israel? Because they were special, because they were so influential, because they had so much to offer, because they were big and important? He says, none of those reasons. So that God could be glorified. That's why they were called out, blessed of God, not to be a dead end of blessing, but to be a blessing to the world. The reason... Jesus came and died on the cross to save us, same thing. Not that it would be a dead end of spiritual value, but that it would flow out of us to the rest of the world that desperately needs to know Jesus. It is by grace we have what we have, and we share that grace with the rest of the world to be a blessing to the rest of the world. We're stewards of God's grace. We carry it forward. We have this great commission. In uh, ancient times, nomadic tribes uh, moving from one place to another, just looking for food, they had uh, a lot of different roles that played out, according to anthropologists. And one of those is uh, they'd have a fire carrier. There was, and it was an important job. There was one person in the tribe that would have a specially made pouch where they could carry coals, embers from uh, one camp to the next camp. Because if you have a group of people that... For, for food and for warmth and for safety, they are counting on fire. The fire carrier's role was vital to their survival. And that verse 2, 
of chapter 2. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will also be able to teach others. We are fire carriers. We carry within us as followers of Jesus Christ, disciples, born again believers. We carry with us this precious treasure, this, this message of the gospel. The fire of God's spirit. And Paul said to Timothy, it's a gift and it's been given to you by God's grace and you need to carry it forward. You need to share it. You need to, you need to share it with other people who will share it with other people. It needs to be a generational exchange of, of the story of Jesus passed down between your family members from friend to friend. You share this and you help others to share it faithfully with the world. This is every, don't miss, this is not, well, that's not my calling. No, if you signed on, if you're a Christian, you signed on for this. This is every Christian's calling from from the Lord. We all have this same great commission. And we need to handle the precious gospel well. Here's the second thing. We've been called to a great commitment. Paul, as did Jesus, never watered down the requirements of what it meant. To walk in relationship to God. Serving in his kingdom. Being involved in his purposes in the world. And aside from. We have some tests. Right? We're going to have some tests. That God puts into our life. To to strengthen us. To challenge us. To grow some spiritual muscle. To make us more like Jesus. We're going to go through those times. We're going to have some times of testing. Satan is going to oppose us. And we're going to have some spiritual battle. That takes place from opposition to any movement uh, in lordship of Christ in our life. Where we're trying to decide who's in charge. And Paul shares right up front. This, this Christian life is hard. It's not a walk in the park. There, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of obstacle to be dealt with. And it will require more than a casual commitment to live for Christ. It's going to require more than... Than just drifting in and out of a spiritual world. It's going to require, uh, it's going to require all of you. Especially if we're going to take his message to the world. Have you, have you ever been accused of a great commitment to Christ? I mean, I'm not talking about the, the relative you saw at Christmas that they said, man, you're a religious fanatic. You go to church besides at Christmas and Easter? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about somebody who really knows what it means to be a Christian. Have you ever said, that's a high level of commitment? I really, I, I see in you uh, more, than, more than just mailing it in kind of relationship to God. Have you ever been accused of a great commitment to Christ? Now, Paul, when he talks about commitment, he gives us those three illustrations I highlighted earlier. The first, the priorities of a soldier. Many of you serve armed forces. A soldier doesn't get distracted by things of the world. His, he's, not, he's also not working on his own agenda. Whatever his commanding officer said to do, that's what he's going to do. And he's not going to be off track. See, we get off track as Christians when we base our commitments on what we want instead of what God wants. Man, you know, we have a lot of people who say, I'm a Christian. I'm born again. I'm going to heaven when I die. But man, I think the Lord would have to declare you AWOL. Uh, Not in the game at all. Nothing to indicate that you truly belong to him. Do your priorities in life reflect the purposes of God as spelled out clearly in His Word? And I know, I could have talked about a thousand other things that you wish I talked about besides this. Because this is a defining measure of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And, and and, And you can't pretend when it gets down to this stuff. The priorities of a soldier. The discipline of an athlete. He said, if you're going to win the prize, you have, to, you have to go by the rules. You have to follow the plan. I guess Winter Olympics are coming up uh, next month. And for me, uh, I don't ever like to be cold. So I might try it for the downhill skiing team. But, you know, I'm going to be on the team. And, and, but, but I'm going to stay, in the, I'm gonna stay by, the, by the fire there in the... Uh, yeah, I'm just going to sit with my feet propped up in a warm place. I don't want to get out there. It's cold out there on that hill. Plus, I might, might get hurt. I'm probably not going to make the team with that level of commitment. Just, you have to throw in the athlete. The athlete is going 
It's going to live with a, with a focus, with a discipline. And does, your, does your commitment, does it, does it remain firm when it's hard? Or does it just kind of come and go with the breeze? It, whatever's easy, whatever, where's the path of least resistance? Then the perseverance of a farmer. Well, some of you come from a farming background too. Farming's tough life, right? You're, you're battling things you can't control. You battle, uh, and it's kind of, I was in a farming community before I moved to Allen. And, hey, you battle, when's the rain going to come? Is it going to come at the right time? Is it going to come at the wrong time? Is it going to come at the wrong amounts? Are we going to get a hailstorm at the wrong time? Are we going to get, uh, are we going to have a bunch of weird insects come across and, and just wipe us out? Uh, there's so many different factors that, that play in. But here's what happens. The, the, the farmer, true then, true now, just perseveres. You just keep on. You plant your seeds and you care for them and you pray and if you keep persevering, there's going to be a great harvest. Well, same thing in spiritual things. It takes a great commitment to stay with the Great Commission. Now, motivation, when it comes to okay, why, why gospel? Why? Well, we're motivated by great consideration. In uh, Reader's Digest, this is one of my favorite stories, uh, probably all of you, if you've made any kind of medical appointment in a, ever, uh, you get a call beforehand reminding you about it, don't you? You say, well, I have that on my calendar. You know why they call you? Because people stand them up all the time. That's why. So in this story, it, it was written by someone in a dental office who was calling. You know, I got my reminder. I got a text and a call about a dental appointment for me not too long ago. And I kind of appreciated it, even though it's on my calendar. Well, this person was in a dental office. They're the person that called ahead of time. They had one patient. She, she just hated calling him because she knew he's always late, always late. And it throws off the rest of the schedule. And so this guy, she calls him. Hey, just want to remind you, you have an appointment tomorrow. He said, oh, yeah, hey, I'm probably going to be about 15 minutes late. That's not a problem, is it? I'm an abrasive bird. Ah, that's not going to be a problem, is it? And this time she had a different approach. She said, oh, now you're having a cavity filled, right? He said, yeah. I said, okay, well, that, that's not a problem at all. Now, that 15 minutes, we won't have time to give you the anesthetic, but you can come on. <laughs> he, she said, he was early for his appointment. <laughs> you see, sometimes you just need a little motivation, right? Everybody's motivated by something. Different things motivate different people. Paul understood our need for motivation. And he finishes with these thoughts to Timothy. And I don't know, it just, reading through these things just encouraged me, reminded me of things. And uh, he wanted to remind Timothy of these motivation things. Why the good news? Why the gospel? Why do we need to share it? And what motivates us to do this? And the first one is, we're motivated by the love of Christ. You know, why, do you, why do you go and tell people about Jesus? Why, why, why do you want others to experience this? Because you've experienced it. Oh my goodness. There are people that they just got a good deal at the mall. And they'll tell everybody they know about that. This is Jesus. Eternal life. Don't you think you ought to share that with somebody somewhere sometime? Absolutely. Uh, if, it's met, if it's changed your eternity, how can you not want to share that with other people? He left the glory of heaven to come to this earth, take on a frail human body, die on the cross for the sins of a world, my sins. And he's living for me today. 1 John 3, John 3, 16 is famous. 1 John 3, 16 is a good one too. This is how we have come to know love. He, Jesus, laid down his life for us, and we also should lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Jesus, out of love, gave himself for us. And if we, we say we care about other people, if you love other people, you're just going to have to tell this story. We're motivated by the power of God's Word. We talk about it as God's Word. But, well, the power of this Word. I, I, this is one of my favorite descriptions, Hebrews. For the Word of God is living and effective, sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. When Paul writes this, and you, he, he works that into what he shares in chapter 2. He's in prison. 
uh, this is not going to go well, he anticipates. But even in prison, he says, me being in prison hasn't stopped the word of God from going out. Nothing can stop the word of God from going out. And, and here's the question. Oh, he's in prison and he's still getting it out. What's stopping you from sharing Jesus with the people in your circles of influence? What's keeping you from being in the game? What's keeping you from making a difference in someone's eternity? People that you already care about. Here's the third thing. And this is a big one. Motivated by the masses. Paul saw, I'm just going to do whatever I have to do to share with the people I know and the people I don't know yet who need to know Jesus. And he wrote about, he said, okay, when it comes to your identity, what's your identity as a follower of Christ? Who are you as a follower of Christ? And this is a big part of it. He says, 2 Corinthians 5, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We are representatives of our Savior in this world. Ambassadors for Christ, carrying forward His message, declaring what He's called us to declare to a world that desperately needs to know Jesus. When, when we come to see that people who don't know Jesus are going to go to hell for eternity, it ought to motivate something in us. It ought to touch something deep in our spirit because this is not a, this is not a game. I know that there, I know that you're going to have a lot of false teachers who will tell you everybody's going to heaven. But to do that, you have to say, "I'm making something up contrary to God's word." God's word is so clear on this: heaven is for eternity, hell is for eternity, and a lot of people are going to spend that eternity in hell. And these are people you know, people who are your friends, your neighbors, the people you work with, people who live in your world of influence. And we need to have a greater commitment to care about them. And then motivated by the faithfulness of the Father. And Paul talks about he's faithful. Even when we're, we struggle, he is faithful. God is so very faithful. And we know that and we thank him. But the way you show your love, like, oh, I'm so, God, I'm so glad you're faithful. I love you so much. We can sing songs about it and we can declare it. But it's not true unless we demonstrate, <laughs> we demonstrate our love for him by doing what he said. That's the definition of how. How do you know you're, you love God? No, it's not by your declarations, but what you do. And this is how he said it. If you love me, Jesus said, you'll keep my commandments. You'll just do what I told you to do. If you love me, you do what I told you to do. This is Jesus who said, make disciples of all nations. Jesus who said, you should be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. John, late in his life, John the Apostle, he wrote, In this is love, not that we've loved God, but that he loved us. There's your motivator. And, and sent his son to be the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. If, if God was willing to send his son all the way from the glory of heaven to this broken world, that we might be saved... Uh, would you be willing to go across the street to tell that story to somebody else? Would you be willing to go to another country to tell somebody else? If, uh, and a lot of people do, somebody you love, neighbor, friend, they have cancer, and somehow you figured out the cure to cancer, all cancer. Would you keep that to yourself? Would you just hang on to that? Like, well, in case I get cancer one day, I'm going to have this uh, card to play. No, it'd be criminal. You'd want to share that message with everyone. You'd want to get that out there. You'd want everyone to know. Uh, there are a lot of real problems in our world. You know, the, war, disease, famine, terrorism, sinfulness, brokenness. And I want you to get this. We have a cure for all that ails the world, for the brokenness. That ails the world. And it is Jesus Christ. It's the story of the gospel. Where people can have forgiveness of sin. Peace with God. Purpose in life. Eternal life in heaven. So we have the greatest news in the world. And sharing it is the greatest kindness. The greatest love you can share. With anybody, anywhere, anytime. 
I thought about this message, and I thought, okay, so let me, let, me, let me put me in here. So I've been a Christian for 40, 46, 47 years now. And that puts me at a high risk of something. It puts me at the high risk of forgetting how hopeless somebody is without Jesus. How lost someone can be with, without Jesus and I am tempted, me too, to define God's expectations of me as, well, I need to be a good person, I need to be a good father, I need to be a good husband, I need to be a good guy at work, I need to be a good person with my Christian friends. And it's safe, fairly benign, and, and it doesn't tell anybody about Jesus. For lots of us, I think our role as Christians in our culture, particularly, has been defined as we're going to be Christians who we hunker down in the Christian bunker. Uh, we're, we're happy in the holy huddle. Uh, that sort of idea. To disengage from a sinful world. And we find that pattern of, well, I'm going to stick with my Christian people and my Christian friends. And we find that pattern in the Bible. The people who did that so well were the people that the Bible refers to as the Pharisees. And Jesus had his harshest, harshest words, harsh, harshest words for them. You know, I, I'm happy in my Christian world, my Christian subculture. And uh, you know, after all these years as a believer, the other thing is that I had to, I had to expand my circles of influence to include a whole lot more lost people, because the more time you spend as a Christian. Uh, you're just with a lot of other Christians. And so, some, some for me is, I had to be intentional about expanding my circles so that I was spending more time with lost people who need to know Jesus with my pre-Christian friends. So, so much we spend time with our Christian friends, awesome. We're in our, we love our Christian Bible studies and we go to our Christian events. And, but I think Jesus really intended the life of the believer to be filled with more adventure than that. And the reason a lot of people drift away from church is because they've never actually experienced Christ. They've just experienced the religion part of it. And there's nothing engaging about religion. But a living relationship to a living Savior, uh, being on mission in eternal things, uh, that's a different kind of story. He invites us. Our Savior invites us to join Him in this incredible gospel-sharing work. There are, he talked about lost sheep. Uh, they're lost sheep, and the lost sheep need to be found. He looked, and they were like sheep without a shepherd. And, oh, he felt compassion on them, it says to Jesus. Uh, you know the, the uh, little nursery rhyme about little Bo Peep? Little Bo Peep lost her sheep. Yeah, she didn't know where to find them. And you know what her, remember what her solution was? Well, leave them alone. They'll come home wagging their tails behind them. Well, I think a lot of people have approached their gospeling that way. That, well, they're just going to... I'll leave them alone, and eventually they'll figure it out. But more and more, as our Christian uh, predisposition to at least a Christian worldview has disappeared in our country, uh, they're not coming. And so, I think we've got to go back to God's original plan, which has always been really clear. Instead of uh, leave them alone, and they'll come home wagging their tails behind them, it's uh, for Christians, get off your tail and go find them. That's the biblical declaration. We are to share the gospel of Christ. Where do you do this? You know, we're going to care about the whole world. But one of the largest mission fields in the world is right here under our nose. There's an estimated, North American Mission Board estimates, somewhere in the neighborhood of 235 million Americans who do not have a relationship to Christ. 235 million in your own country. Those of you who say America is a Christian nation, you might say it was founded on some Christian principles. This is, this is a pagan nation, overwhelmingly so. It's far from God, far from being a Christian nation. 235 million of your fellow Americans have no relationship to Christ, and that's generous. Uh, that means that only China, India, and Indonesia have, it's the fourth largest unreached nation in the world. Those other three countries are, have a higher population of unreached people for Christ than we do. We're number four in the world in that category. 
And if we're going to reach those individuals with the love of Christ, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to take our faith outside of ourselves and outside of our walls and take it everywhere we go into all the circles of influence where we have a voice, where we have influence, where we have relationships. We're going to have to be intentional about it. The why of the gospel is so clear. Uh, for all the reasons we've outlined. The, the who of the gospel is clear. It's those people in our circles of influence. People God's already dropped us into these circles. People we already know who don't know Jesus. The what of the gospel is clear. It, and if it's not for you, if you don't have a great way to share the gospel, we have another training coming up in February, but many of you have been so overwhelmingly faithful. You've jumped in. You've been to one of our gospel conversations training of what you share. A very simple gospel presentation. The what? Jesus died on the cross, buried, raised from the dead. If you will put all your faith in what he did at the cross and being raised from the dead, if you'll surrender your life to him, uh, your sin can be forgiven. You have eternal life and you also have a purpose and you have, you, have a, you have a mission to go and share that with the rest of the world. So really, all that remains, once the why and the who and the water squared away, is the when. When are you going to do it? And why not today? Why not today? I want to give you a place to start. We spent a big part of last year focused in this. And we haven't mentioned it as much this year. But it's 10 o'clock. And in two minutes, my phone alarm is going to go off. As it does every day. Because at 10.02, my alarm is going to go off. Many of you have kept your alarm at 10.02 to be reminded of Luke 10.2. The harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest will send out labors into the harvest. And I want to be one of those laborers. You have to get it on your radar to connect your heart with God's heart as a great first step. And then you add in, and so I quickly add it in, and here are the people in my circles of influence that I'm praying for uh, that, that need to know Jesus. Maybe you set a separate alarm for that. And then somewhere in there, you just strike up a gospel conversation. We'll give you the tools to have a good gospel conversation. Many of you have been through the training. It's just a matter of following through and taking a step of faith, believing that God's already at work in front of you. And we have plenty of evidence of that. Why not today? Today, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Here's the thing about the Lord's Supper. It's, it's not a religious activity that we do, that we just come down here and do what we've always done. And we check that box. Uh, in fact, the Bible talks about spiritual preparation. That if you don't do that. If you do it thoughtlessly, carelessly. Without focus on what's happening. It, it, you, you're asking for the judgment of God on your life. How about that? That's why a lot of people are better off. If you can't pull that off. And the focus in. You may need to pass on the Lord's Supper today. And spend this time in spiritual preparation. Because you, you, you may be inviting the judgment of God on your life. That's a big deal. The gospel is not a game to be played. This is a precious something. A treasure. And when we celebrate this, we're reminded. Jesus' body on the cross. Jesus' blood shed for us. And what that means for our life. And what it means for our eternity. And what it means for the mission that we've been entrusted. Of sharing this gospel. And all those things wrapped around what we're going to do. So here's what's going to happen. We'll have some verses to encourage you. On, play on the screens. We'll have some music. Um, we're not going to invite you up by rows. Uh, it's when your spiritual preparation is done. Once you've prepared your heart and you're ready, you can step out from where you are. You can come down. You've already made a commitment of your life to Christ. This is a remembering time. Those of you who have not yet made that commitment, this is a testimony time. Remind, think about, Jesus did this for me. His body, his blood, that my sin could be forgiven. He could pay all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. It's testimony to you. Maybe today's the day you give your life to Christ. And I'll be around. Others will be around. They can visit with you about that. Uh, so what's going to happen when you're ready? You get it from where you are. You come forward. 
the table over here is uh, gluten free. And uh, so uh, that's available for you. Again, cup inside of a cup. Take the cups apart. One has the bread, one has the cup. You can go to the edge of the building. You can go to the steps. You can go back to your seat once you've gotten uh, the elements of the Lord's Supper. You can do this together as a family. Do it with friends. You can do this uh, individually, just you alone before God. Uh, we won't all do it at the same time because our preparations will take uh, different amounts of time. But uh, when you're ready, you come and you take the cup. We'll have deacons, uh, for deacons to come on up. They're going to be uh, standing at these different stations to be available to pray for you. Many of you have enormously complicated, uh, difficult things going on in your life. And you need somebody to pray out loud for you. And there's power in prayer. And uh, they're available to pray with you and for you in the needs of your lives. For our deacons to come on forward, and I want to pray for us as we continue to focus on the gospel. And the preciousness of the gospel.